enjoy it. Right. Okay, um, should I use this mic or? Okay. Uh, I'll use this mic. I, while I'm going to talk about behavior, I'm going to talk about the origins of biometrics. And uh, think of a society where a lot of people didn't really have names. I mean, in India, to some extent, that's been the case in this century, and now they're giving everybody a 12-digit number. But uh, in the good old days, merry old England, uh, I suppose uh, around the time uh, Australia was being established, a lot of people were being locked up and uh, for stealing loaves of bread, etc. If somebody's stealing something, you don't need to know their identity. You catch them red-handed. Who cares who they are? You put them in jail. And that's how the legal system worked. If somebody was stealing, the name was inc incidental. You caught them on their behaviour because they were stealing and you put them in jail. And who cares about the name? No. Uh, and you, you don't care about the address. Now, the French brought in some legislation uh, in the sort of mid-1800s, I think it was, and they said that if somebody committed a crime twice, they got a higher punishment. And if there was a higher punishment, you have to know who you've caught. And so this actually was the origin of biometrics, uh, because the originally they said, how do you know you've caught the same person? Because, of course, the criminal is going to give you two different names. So the name is no use. You needed some other means. And so originally, uh, the um, Bethion method actually measured the lengths of the arms, uh, circumference of the head, etc., etc., to re identify prisoners. And of course, there was a big battle between that system and what became the fingerprinting system. And fingerprinting sort of won out, uh, largely because it was cheaper. Uh, and it was, it, you could do it with an untrained policeman rather than an expert in biometric measurement who had to very precisely measure everything. So, so back in the good old days, identity had nothing to do with crime. And uh, now we tend to, you know, people have names and they have addresses. I mean, it wasn't until Napoleon went through Europe that houses even had street numbers, so the address wouldn't help you because you couldn't find anything. And you didn't know people's names. And a lot of the names were the same in any case, and this is a little bit like it is in Afghanistan at the moment. So behaviour is the fundamental method of uh, finding criminals, and uh, identity is secondary to that. But what we're finding now, uh, especially on the internet, uh, that a lot of crimes are committed by people who don't have identities or are not on watch lists. Because the watch lists are very, very large and you can't find people there. So you have to identify the behaviour. And I, I think it would be good if ISBO, rather than concentrating 100% on identity, does move towards behaviour, because that's the fundamental way to identify um, bad people. Uh, it was, we, when we had a dinner the other night, it turned out it was the building that Edward Snowden stayed in. Now, he was fully authorised, they knew exactly who he was, but he behaved very badly and stole state secrets. So even knowing somebody's identity doesn't mean you can trust them. So what you'd like with Edward Snowden is to detect his bad behaviour, not his identity. So I think we should be doing both. No, you're starting on a very peaceful way. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, that takes two to argue, Rama. Sorry, sorry. Good. I think you should just say identity is of no use, behavior is good. We'll be fine. Let's, let's warm up. Go ahead. Okay, I, I, I prepare some slides for that. Sure. Because we have the LFW data set, 
and uh, capture in the wild, and then uh, we have unconstricted conditions and the subjects are non cooperative. But the difference is um, we are talking about videos. Okay, in videos, the, the problem will be totally different. And uh, Rama is here, that's why I have such a Rama work on uh, face recognition from video. And uh, if, uh, if you're working on face recognition, you may probably know that uh, Rama already published a monograph with his two PhD students in uh, 2010, if I remember correctly. There's unconstrained face recognition. That means uh, this is not a new problem, this is an old problem. But I would say this is an unsolved problem. Uh, I'm not sure Rama agree with that. Okay, but in the last two days, uh, you may notice that a lot of uh, encouraging results has been reported uh, from uh, using the deep models, uh, sparse learning, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the accuracy from, uh, say, 80% to 90% to 99% to 99.43 and then 99.6 and so on and so forth, uh, which is very encouraging, of course. Uh, but I will show you uh, why uh, face recognition from video is more challenging from the, than the FFW dataset later on. But another thing is, uh, for that accuracy, as far as I can understand, that's, they are talking about the verification result, but not identification result. Okay, so my question is very simple. I just want to trigger how uh, the behavior analysis of what the others could you know, uh, help to solve this problem. Okay, I would like to uh, take two cases uh, why this is a hard problem. So if we go back to the two years ago, uh, there was a Boston Marathon bombing. And uh, this is the video that normally we, uh, that we can capture, uh, also we listed from FBI. So if you look at this uh, video, so you can easily show that uh, we have all the challenges from uh, in-face recognition. That's including illumination changes, uh, post variations, occlusion, a lot of things. But what else, what addition is uh, the face regions, normally the color is not good. And also uh, the, the, the image is good, okay? So if you just look at the snapshot from this video, so if you want to, you know, uh, say, uh, we want to identify these two guys, basically the, the, the resolution is very small, and also it's blurred. So if you compare with, uh, say, one image in uh, LFW dataset, so you see the quality difference, okay? So in LFW, the quality is excellent. But uh, in the science video, uh, even though there's a high definition uh, video, but still uh, the region of space region is relatively small. So if you go back to uh, 2013, we have a spectrum, and uh, the spectrum also uh, interviewed one uh, Boston Police Force, and they also used the face recognition technology to identify the suspect. And what this, what is that? Uh, face recognition software did not identify the man in the ball caps. The technology came up empty, even though both people in these two images exist in the official database. So this is the, the, the what they said. Okay. So uh, this is the result, and uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, Professor Jane, with Andrew Jane Group in from Michigan State University also did a very simple but a very uh, meaningful experiment. Uh, what they did is uh, they tried to uh, make use of the uh, suspect images as a book image from FBI, uh, including two, uh, sorry, two, uh, one A and one B, and two A and two C. Okay, so these are uh, pop images, and then uh, they have other images. Oops other images and then mixed up with a database uh, with one million images and then do this kind of experiment. Uh, at that time, uh, we have two, uh, I would say, the best uh, face market of blue face recognition face engine, the new face 3.1 and also PPAC uh, 5.2.2. Uh, at that time, unfortunately, we don't have a deep model. Okay, and then perform a free type of search, a blind search, filter search using uh, the birth data, and also fil uh, filter search. So this is the result. So if you look at the first two uh, images, you see uh, the rank one to rank three accuracy actually is uh, very, not very encouraging. So at the same time, if you look at the rank uh, in the one million uh, data set, because we're, we're performing uh, identification. So this is the rank we obtained. That if you match one A, with one X, one X, Y, one Z, and this is the rank of uh, 100,000, 100,000, uh, 80,000, and so on and so forth. So which is, well, not very encouraging. So, but at the same time, if you look at uh, two, two A, two B, two C, together with two H, two, two Y, two Z, for two A, uh, not good, two B, not good, but if you look at two, two C, the result is very encouraging, okay? So you can identify um, another image in the data set uh, with rank one. So which is very good. 
And uh, in the report, the author also mentioned that if you look at these two images closely, you, you can easily notice that in these two images, these two images, uh, the pose, uh, the facial expressions, they are almost the same. Okay, because of that, uh, we can easily perform our uh, identifications. Okay, for a pre uh, uh search engine, the result uh, again uh, not very good. So if you look at the filter search result, uh, I would say more or less the same. Uh, if you look at the filter search, uh, the result uh, same pattern. Okay, so uh, what we can conclude from this uh, simple experiment is that uh, face recognition is, is useful. Uh, we should put more effort on that, but not totally solve the problem, I would say. Okay, another case uh, that I would like to use is related to Hong Kong, because we're in Hong Kong. So two weeks ago, we have an uh, armed robbery at Jim Sarge, uh, which is about maybe just 10 minutes walk from uh, Pauline Yu. Uh, the armed robbery uh, went into a luxury workshop, and he got away of 5.5 million worth of goods. I was told only 10 watches. Uh, a shopper was sort of suited in the chest as he tried to stop him feeling. So uh, again, uh, don't worry, uh, Hong Kong is safe. Okay, but this is a uh, exceptional case. I would say totally exceptional case. Um, last time, uh, the armed robbery maybe more than 10 years ago. So statistically, uh, Hong Kong is very safe in the coming nine years. Okay, so what, 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 what they can obtain for the images, something like that. Okay, so the, this is the, this is actually work, this is not the uh, uh, suspect. Uh, this is the, the, the robbery. So uh, he was wearing a mask, and another photo that we can obtain is like that. So you may ask, okay, under this scenario, everyone that this, this guy is very strange uh, with moss. But if you date back to 2003 in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong was named as the city of moss because of SARS. So at that time, after everybody wearing masks. So there's nothing special in Hong Kong, people wearing masks. Uh, when people, this is a common practice, when people not feeling well, uh, have some kind of, uh, say, flu, coughing, uh, running nose, they automatically put a mask. Okay, so uh, my question is, okay, can behavior analysis, uh, behavior biometrics, soft biometrics, uh, even people identification or other researchers could help to solve this uh, hard problem? So, thank you.
using square basis of TV as material. So, I mean, that clearly, if you think about it that way, it's not efficient. And I think just that there's been a move in London to basically say, like, okay, if we change all the cameras for high definition cameras, then we can add face recognition and then maybe we can do better. And at which point I go, like, oh, <laughs> you know, you don't get it. Uh, it's the belief that just making the technology better in terms of, you know, fiddling with one aspect of it, this is not going to work. So, if we look at, if we use the example of, you know, let's try and use face recognition in order to identify people better. What is actually the problem? The problem is you've got a general purpose system recording, you know, basically being there and recording video footage. And the reality is for detecting bad behavior, you need a completely different configuration than you need in order to identify a person, right? So they are set to record at a certain frame rate. But if you want to identify somebody, if you want good material to identify, what you should do is take one shot every minute at really high resolution. Whereas if you're trying to see, for instance, drug dealing or, or somebody basically you know, assaulting a person or something, you need a high frame rate. You know, say drug dealing, you know, these guys are pretty sophisticated when they when they basically swap, you know, the drugs for the money and it's usually not one person doing the same thing. You need a really high frame rate to see how they very casually slip some things and go ahead. So that's the first thing that would need to happen is you need to actually say what kind of you know what kind of um, how, how, what are we trying to do and then how do we configure the system to actually give us a decent quality input into the biometrics we are trying to apply. And I think until that happens, you know, we, <laughs> we're going to fight a losing battle to get good performance. So, so that's a conversation we need to have, have very early on. The second point then is, is what, what I think is really holding back better performance in this field is that we're not getting realistic data sets during our research effort, right? Um, so I was like horrified when I spoke to one of the PhD students yesterday um, who is trying to, to, to get better performance out of the face recognition systems used for the passports um, and that are very widely deployed in the European Union and the UK has one of those systems. And um, I said to him, so, God, so the border agency has finally seen sense and is letting you use real footage in order to analyze what's going wrong. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to get 100 people or whatever, I can't remember the number, to come in and I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, that is crazy. The real world material is there. You know, how many people do you think you need? 100? It's not 100, it's not enough to get you a demographically representative sample, right? You need thousands, right? And that, of course, like a PhD student can't do, the resources would be fine. Would be, so, you know, I think this is the other real thing. So if you want to solve real world problems, we need to get the people who own the real world material to give it to researchers, right? And I don't know what it's like in, in your countries, but and, and I think actually in Asia often that works better. You know, there is a more pragmatic attitude to actually saying like, okay, let's work together and give them to you. But I've certainly found in, 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 in the UK um, and in most European countries, this can be incredibly difficult. Law enforcement tends to be incredibly you know, reluctant to do this. And if you look at the history, you know, since we're talking about the history of biometrics, you know, if you look at the history of fingerprinting, for instance, I think it's, you know, if you think about it, it's a scandal. You, know, uh, you must be aware of that NIST, was it now three years ago, finally issued uh, a basically a manual and set standards for fingerprint matching, right? Following a couple of really bad cases where misidentification had been, been made, you know, basically if the words uh, Gina McKee, you know, for instance, don't mean anything to you, where a policewoman, you know, fought for nine, had been uh, accused of, on the grounds of, of a misidentification of fingerprint, you know, or the Brandon Mayfield case where this guy was obtained for three weeks after the Madrid bombings. You know, on, on really on a fingerprint match, you know, basically made from from partials and and, uh, and and digital slaps, you know, rather than fully rolled fingerprints and things like that. If you and, and NIST finally it took them a hundred years. We've been using fingerprints for a hundred years, and it took a hundred years to actually get a manual to say if you want to use this as evidence of proof, here are the standards, right? 
Um, and, and, it's, and until then, it's been completely random, right? In some countries, you need 10 points of correspondence. In other, you need 16. In some, it's enough if two people go and, and look at it and agree to, to have matched. You know, in others, it's four, and you know, and, and so on. And it, it's certainly in the UK, you know, it really rocked the the, the faith in figure. I mean, basically, as a result of, of this one case, you know, basically now defence lawyers stand up in court and say, you know, fingerprint evidence isn't reliable. You know, they're starting to challenge it. So it's it's you need really, you know, um, I think we need really much clearer guidelines as scientists. You know, when we put things out in the field, we need to insist on what the thresholds are, the levels of proofs are, and what the procedures are that have to be followed in, in order to make those identifications. And we can't do that if we don't get realistic material to work with. And I think at the moment that's a real that's that's something we really have problems with. Right? We're not. We're not actually. The, the, the cost of you know we, we're always scraping. As, as, so somebody got a prize yesterday for the you know the, the, this you know it's great that you establish this tattoo database. But that was a lot of time and effort, right, to, to get this together, um, what, and, and not being able to access real world materials that the people who want to use our our research have is is you know I think it's just ridiculous. Um, this is something we need to to overcome. Um, so that we can do better science in the lab in order to get proper application of science in the field. Um, I think that is, you know, it's very clear the history of identification has shown that, and I think it will apply to behavior as well. So as I said yesterday, I'm in favor of looking uh, of that we should use behavioral biometrics more, um, not only because, um, as Brian said, because it's, you know, you care about, you know, very often what you're trying to do is prevent bad behavior, right? And so if you see it occurring, you'd like to intervene rather than just do a forensic um, uh, situation afterwards, right? So um, that's that's actually, uh, but we need to be very careful and um, as, you know, this is the ethical responsibility we have as researchers. To the, the danger with this is if, if we don't clear up this relationship between us as researchers and the standards of proof that we have, and how this is going to be used in the field, particularly by law enforcement, then we're going to very quickly end up in the department of pre-crime, you know, that, um, that you get, get in some of the Hollywood movies, you know, where basically this is sort of seen as standards of proof that somebody meant to do um, something, something dodgy, and then really, you, you know, you, you end up in the world of, of the author Kafka, you know, where you really don't know what you're being accused of, and you have no way of disproving, um, you know, disproving it. So um, the final thought in here is the other thing that, that would really help is I think basically multidisciplinary, I come here at UCL, we have a multidisciplinary security um, doctoral training center. It's been going for about six, six years now and that's proved really, really enlightening to, to have this. So we have um, a computer scientists, but engineers, but scientists from the whole spectrum, geologists, chemists, um, and uh, also social scientists working together. And that's actually proved really enlightening to say if you have a particular real world problem, how you, how you apply that. And I think in terms of developing, um, you know, this developing an understanding of how the technology would be used, I think our students actually need a bit more exposure to this. So for instance, you know, if you, if you uh, take a class in, a basic class in crime science, when you introduce the technology, right, the, the attacker is going to adapt. That, that happens in the physical real world. It also it happens even more so when you're looking at cybersecurity and you're looking at attacks in the cybersecurity world. And if you're trying to develop a technique that will help, you need to actually understand and anticipate that. So in London, when people rob a high-end jewelry store, you currently your face recognition is not going to work at all. Any idea why? Ski masks, did it? No, much better than that. They basically use use uh, you know Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. right? They basically use those type masks. We've had two to really I mean basically tens of millions uh, of pounds sterling robberies uh, happened in the UK. One on on, on a, a jeweler in Bond Street, a couple of years previously on a cash depot out in the countryside, and in both cases. You get fantastic video of the attackers, but of course they were wearing these, these 
smarter than this, no way you can identify them from the videos. So the attackers will adapt, and you need to think about um, you need to think about that. This raises the question: What is easy to hide? Identity or behavior? You have you cannot hide behavior because you still want to steal and run away. Whereas you can always wear a mask or. or Make yourself yes, look like somebody else. No, basically, if, if I could direct you to the um, to uh, a technique beloved by U.S. law enforcement, the lie detector test, right? That's a behavior thing. Can you hide the response to the question you ask? And the answer is, with training, yes, you absolutely can. Not everybody can, but a lot of people give them the right. No, training. I meant when you have to do a, a nasty act. That behavior is something that you know you cannot pretend to be a good guy and suddenly the camouflaging that is a little bit more difficult. But that's difficult. that's actually another lesson that from crime science that can actually really help here to, to narrow down what makes sense to do and what doesn't make sense to do, right? Because um, it's it's in security, it's very rarely about perfect prevention, right? You're just basically trying to make it hard enough, expensive enough for the attacker uh, to, to, to commit that crime, right? I mean, basically, so crime scientists will tell you that most attackers, if, I mean, unless it's an ideological or emotionally uh, motivated attack, will only if, uh, invest 10% of the expected gain into, into the attacks that they are doing. And so what you can very often do, and I think, again, what you can do with smart technology is you can just push them, push it out of the range where it just gets too expensive or too inconvenient. So um, I, I think basically that there is really a lot we can do, I think particularly with behavioral techniques, but we really need to have, have a realistic material, good quality material to work with, and we need to develop clear standards for what is you know, a, a correct identification of behavior. And when you, and, and I think there's just so many opportunities being, being missed with, with systems that are called to not learn, you know, to assume you take the stuff out of the box and put it somewhere and now it's working. You know, it's, it's not, you know. And say for instance, I mean, there have been the examples with iris recognition. You know, it worked a million miles better at Schiphol Airport than it did in Heathrow Airport, right? Because in Schiphol they actually looked at problems we met and started adjusting it and started, started learning from it. Um, and, and I think that is one of the things, if you have a complex technology, you need to stay with it, keep learning it, keep, keep improving it, and you need to do that with scientific advice. Maya, you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, uh, in I read an article some years ago about the... Uh, Can you use the microphone? Yeah. So I read an article about the uh, predictive analytics. Yes. Do you think that predictive analytics help? Um, I think again. This, yes. In UK. Yes. Uh, I think again the standard. You know, it doesn't. It's an interesting idea, but I think whether it really works or not is the standard. It doesn't, in my mind, currently the the, the, the evidence that it does work isn't isn't there. In fact. Um, and I mean, the, there is the kind of analytics that's being used, for instance, to to, to predict where crimes are going right. to occur. So that basically is is it has nothing to do with identification. Right, 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 it's right. only it's looking at it's information about yeah. location, and there are behaviours associated. Mm -hmm. You know, there are basically behaviours associated, and there are there, there is this is set for for specific predictive analytics where it's proven to actually yes, where the predictions have proven to. to but very often then, of course, because we, we're having the ethical dilemmas, you need to be like a medic, you need to do like, like medical researchers. Okay. You then need to not make the predictions and immediately swoop down and prevent the crime. You need to basically do that in one part and not do it in the other and see, you know, and, and see whether your predictions are actually true, rather than basically immediately going, like, oh, goody, we have a prediction now, that's, you know, and you're never actually really doing the proper test. That's, of course, quite, quite difficult, but it's a real dialogue we have to have. Maya, go for it. So uh, since I'm uh, licensed to kill, I'll start with the statement. So the statement is that many people can share a bi uh, behavior, essentially, but not the biometric information. So biometric information is unique, but behavior may not be unique. Because I may have some behavior which may be actually shared by, let's say, 50 more thousand people. Uh, in India, um, uh, India, as I say, it's a unique country. Uh, we have lots of ideas and lots of traumas. And uh, many of those actually may have similar um, uh, way of interacting with the system. 
are interacting with uh, people, are interacting with systems. And therefore, uh, it's not always that uh, behavior can help us. At the same time, uh, uh, they all have their unique fingerprints, unique hierarchies, and unique faces. And therefore, at least I believe in that identity can be helped. But at the same time, I also believe that biometrics is not a magic wand. It cannot solve all the problems. It has to be, uh, it, it's, as, as we all know, that biometrics is a tool in identification science where it has a, a, a certain process. And it has to be covered with certain policies and certain uh, procedures. Since we cannot just put a face recognition system uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, where, where we are not having any physical person, like a face recognition system where everyone is wearing a mask. We really cannot have a physical system over there, but we may have actually iris recognition system or periopular biometrics. Uh, we may not actually be uh, very interested in uh, uh, a fingerprint uh, system where uh, uh, people may not actually have the fingerprints. In fact, in India, when uh, they were doing this biometric uh, pilot study in UID project, uh, we realized that certain, in one of the districts actually, which were having um, most of these uh, tobacco industry workers, they were not having their fingerprint information. Now, there we cannot use fingerprint um, over there, but we can potentially use iris. So therefore, we have to look at what is the problem statement, what is the application domain, and um, uh, what, what actually is the right modality for that particular application. I remember a couple of years ago, one of the law enforcement agencies uh, in India came to us and said that, hey, you know, we have a problem in face recognition, can you solve it? And we asked, okay, can you please explain the problem? They said, everything that you can think in face recognition, starting from sketch recognition to decompose body to uh, surveillance application, everything. And we said, uh, I'm sorry, we cannot give you one unique solution which can solve each and every problem, because each and every problem in itself is um, uh, solved uniquely. I guess if there is a dead body, decomposed body, we cannot solve using a traditional system, you may want to do something else. We may, want, we may first want to actually render this based on the scan information, we want to first render and then perform the recognition. Whereas if there is only a sketch information, the sketch information may not be very rich in texture and therefore we even need to look into some other approaches within face information. So it, it, we need to understand that, um, uh, as I said, biometrics is not a magic wand, we need to understand that how this magic wand has to be applied in certain applications. And depending on different applications, we need to um, make sure that um, we are utilizing all the cues or all the information that, that's available to us. And I personally believe in uh, going the multi-model. So if we have multiple information coming from multiple sources, and behavior is one of them. So we should actually uh, think that uh, behavior aids in biometrics. We cannot just like leave out behavior or leave out biometrics and say, hey, you know, individually we need to solve this uh, and say that individually whether this can do or this can do, there's no competition going on over there. Because we need to, at the end of the day, we all want uh, to establish identity and have a secure world. So why can't we have actually both of them combined and uh, solve the problem? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, eventually what we will probably say that both are good, but I'm not ready to go there yet. I want an argument. Yeah, good. Okay, I'm going to argue with that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, there's a very common misconception because of Hollywood and all the spy films and stuff that security cameras are put there to solve crimes. They're not. They're generally put there for completely different reasons. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, there's hardly any public surveillance cameras. I'm not sure if there are any at all, but it's a very highly surveilled city. Britain, uh, London may have a lot of council controlled cameras and they were put there for crime, but the vast majority were put there for by private companies for private concerns. Sorts of concerns are staff stealing from the company, uh, having an argument with the customer deciding who's right, so that in banks they almost always have cameras pointing down. Sometimes it's just to check on queue length and so on. So, you know, when you say they're sort of not fit for purpose, you have to think of who's actually paying for these things and why they put them in there. Some cameras are put in there purely for governance, so that if something happens, the manager doesn't lose his job. Uh, in the New South Wales Art Gallery, there was a um, $5 million painting stolen, and the room it was stored in had no CCTV systems installed, and nobody had a clue what happened. So you can imagine if you're the boss, and you haven't installed CCTV cameras, you can lose your job. So some of them were just put there as a CYA strategy. So that's 
Uh, one aspect, but don't think the cameras are there for security. They're put in for completely different purposes. Usually, we just happen sometimes to be useful for crime. So, and the public is not generally bearing the cost of all these cameras for security. They're, they're used every day for a whole bunch of other yeah, reasons. Not the <laughs> I mean, you know. some, some are, but in, in many places, like even in Australia, recently, a girl was uh, taken from the street and killed, and the footage that um, Help put her away came from a bridal shop that just put the CCTV in the day before to protect the bridal store, but it happened to go through the window and caught her being uh, you know, abducted on the street. So it's private CCTV. But the response to government is putting more public CCTV, but in fact, there's far more private cameras out there. And one thing that's really useful is to think of how we can really leverage all these private cameras, which are you know, all separate systems and you know, they're, they're quite disparate. And just another thing on behaviour, I was at the London Met. And they're saying that quite often the CCTV is not useful for identifying people, often because they're public liability cameras looking down. You just can't see people. But what they're really useful for is observing their behaviours and deciding in a court how much of a penalty it should be. So if somebody is, for example, hit on the street or, or punched by a gang, uh, if you see the video, you can see who's in the wrong and what's going on and how violent it is. When you just hear stories from bypass, uh, from people standing by, you just don't know. You know, the person can say they're provoked, etc., etc. And another interesting use in the London uh, riots and so on is uh, a person did a crime, you couldn't see their face, but they dropped something and they worked out that that item that they dropped would have DNA evidence on it. So the police went and grabbed the object that was dropped and actually got biometric evidence from the CCTV by getting the DNA off the object that was put in the bin. And it's, so it's, a, yeah, there's a, it's a, really, there's very, very broad usage here and it's not a, you know, it's, it's, there's not a narrow focus. And certainly in surveillance, which is used mostly to detect and analyze behaviors, and there are very few surveillance cameras that actually have a really good look at the face. They're usually placed high and looking down, and they're sort of what are called public liability cameras, rather than ones in doorways, for example, which can be uh, designed for face recognition. All right, I think the panelists have made their opening statements, and uh, still very uh, pleasant, so it's <laughs> okay. Um, any questions from the audience? What do you think? Identity is easy to deceive, or it's more effective, it's motive, or you know, behavior, which is better? And what do you mean by security? Let's just understand that because for us, we have to define. You know, security. We are talking about online transactions, or personal security, physical security, the various kinds of that, and. Um, Given that, then we can say which one will play a bigger role. Uh, my the next question would be eventually should we drop I from ISPA and just do you know, behavior and security? Because there's so many biometrics conferences, uh, right? You can have new conferences, BSA, behavior and security. Okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, no, no. Okay, Kenny, come on. You're too quiet. Challenge the panelists. Any questions from the audience? This is your chance. See? Okay, I have a dumb question. Yeah. You can use the, the mic. mic. Use the mic. Okay. <coughs> I don't know how to use. All right. Thanks. I think that's, 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 we just, uh, you know, just uh, scroll some question at you. Uh, we know that uh, some public events, right? Public events. And you have a camera security manual yes. at least, right? And uh, if your face, I mean, I'm wondering that if your face uh, and also your fingerprints, if you, if you put online, right? So, you know, you can use a Google Vision, right? You know, one saw or uh, many saw, many millions of uh, photos. If I have your face, can I use that tool to, and to, can I use that photo or you that fingerprint to make, uh, you know, some face, face size, I mean face mouth, or some face fingerprint size. You know, there's a, there, I, I heard some colleagues told me this, that uh, Japan has this technology yeah. to make very, like, I mean, near to a perfect, you know, face like super people. And some people use that stuff to just go through, go through the, you know, the chat, the chat, the chat port, the chatting port, the XI port. So I mean, you, you see, I mean, what are, this is big, I mean, risk for uh, matching data if we if you put it online. You like full at face on your fingerprint. If I got this stuff, I make some, yeah, I mean, face on your fingerprint. 
so I, I, that I can use as for some criminal stuff, like Boston, you know, Boston Marathon stuff. Boston yeah, Marathon yeah, stuff. So really, I mean, that, that doing, I mean, even doing that, if you want to basically go out, but, but that's really a question of how you use the biometrics. Yes. You know, and that's, that's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, um, we've, we've seen these things. So um, in, um, in the US, you know, it's been, it, they, they put the cameras that are pointed at the border fence. Onto, onto the internet, right? And so, um, you know, if you see somebody doing the undesirable behavior, i.e. burrowing under the fence or trying to cut through it, you're supposed to report it to the police, right? But a lot of people then would instead, you know, if they're really wound up about what's going on, you know, they'll basically take their, you know, the guns which are pretty readily available in that part of the world, you know, and might think, take it in, into their own hands. And we've seen, in the UK, you know, that, that so many cameras are available, actually the police can't really monitor them all, and even the people who pay for them can't monitor them all, so they basically could just put the cameras on the, uh, again, on the internet and ask the public to assist, you know, uh, either by, um, by, by basically, you know, if you spot a, a theft, you know, um, you, you can win a prize if you report it, or um, by putting Facebooks literally of criminals on that say if you see these people coming onto this housing estate, you know, bring the police. And so this whole point of like when you have untrained, you know, when you start to, to, to encourage or co-opt untrained, so that's a whole, you know, to me that's a whole different issue. And in the Boston case, yeah, you know, you put these online, but of course what happened is who is going to recognize them first? Their friends and family. Yes. Are all of them going to do what you think the right thing to do is? No, in that case, two friends of the younger brother went to his apartment, found out, well, he took his computers and destroyed them all in order to protect him from, you know, <laughs> these things. These things, you know, this is never necessarily a clear cut benefit. There's, there's also um, un often undesirable side effects, and you need to think about those, yes. those things. And I think, particularly, I've been concerned with, you know, people who have not been proven. To you know, who may just be suspect, um, putting that online, you know, because there is oh, there is a risk of vigilantism and the wrong people being, you know, sort of like being uh, being accused or basically being being punished, you know, apprehended and and, um, and, and punished. And I don't think in civilized societies you really, you, you want that, right? Yes, by the way, we also we always hear about some in recent. Uh, some possible link to not events, right? Some on Facebook or Google at least. Yeah. I'm, I'm worried that, I, I don't have confidence that if we if we lock, if it's some company, right, they own your fingerprints, or they own your, yeah. you know, own your face. But like that's before, basically, right? we didn't really They lock this data. They, 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 they lock this, and I think it's, you need to really think about this. I mean, we didn't really get to talk much, much about privacy yesterday, right? But, I mean, privacy is, um, is, is, is really, you need to think about that. You know, it's, it's essential protection for a lot of things. You know? If you put all, if you basically put, put all this data online and you allow, you know, we can use, anybody can use it and we can use our own identification. You know, some people, if they feel enough pressure, they will take, you know, there is, is this danger of putting, uh, you know, the law in your, in your own hands. You know, there's basically been some people who have been caught on season doing things in a moment of distress and their life is, is over, right? Their life is ruined. Like you think of the dog poo lady in Korea, you know, or the cat lady in the, in the UK or whatever, and you know, that's it, you know, their life is over. Unless they go and, you know, maybe have facial surgery and get a new name and get it, go into a women's protection program. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's and, and I think this, it's, it's inevitable, you know, as, as Brian said, you know, it's not, a lot of the cameras are privately owned. And a lot of the biometric um, techniques that we develop will be used by private, you know, by private enterprises and private private companies. And they will do. I mean, we have in, in um, we have this term called social sorting, you know. And the better you can identify um, who you're dealing with, the more you can, of course, optimize your commercial delivery, and that can, can lead to, to social, you know, to basically exclusion and social sorting. And I don't think we should. Privacy issue is true both for identity and behavior, right? Because yes. my grocery store shop knows what I buy. They, they give you this thing, bonus card, where they give you some discount coupons, but they actually want to know how many soaps of one kind I buy and this and so. Privacy is kind of gone. Uh, it's not just that somebody has fingerprints. Right, also so have your behavior. shopping patterns and everything they have. No, I think with, behavior, with behavior, you can, um, you can actually 
to preserve privacy more easily. Right. Then, then you know, if you basically set it up to run it as, you know, I want to reward the people who, who behave this way, and I want to, um, you know, disincentivize the people who behave this way, you can do that without identifying them, and you can, you know, you can safeguard people's privacy that way and give them a chance to move from the bad behavior to the to the good behavior when they learn that this is the case. And then, and then you can probably extract the average behavior because a lot of people do similar things and this must be benign, whereas somebody is doing slightly different or so forth. Now, when we talk about identity, there are many characteristics that people mention, uniqueness and existence and et cetera, et cetera. What are similar things in terms of behavior? Uh, how, how it is, we, we feel that sometimes the difference between a good and a bad behavior is very subtle. And, you know, like they like to say, the difference between a genius and a madman is this one, just a big thing. Very, very small. You know, one can be confused as the other. So, whereas in the case of identity, we kind of understand. You know, my face is different from my act. So, how do you determine these kinds of thresholds? The good, good between the good and the bad, or between the benign, and so on. And uh, what do you think is the research that needs to uh, get done? I think the uh, with the behaviors, there's, there's two aspects of behavior. One is to use behavior as a proxy for identification. So uh, this is when somebody types on a keyboard, you can tell who it is. So there we're really using behavior as a way to identify somebody. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, but the other aspect is when the behavior itself is of interest, like the Snowden case where he was stealing secrets by um, asking people for their passwords and these sorts of things. And if somebody had reported what he was doing, uh, then he could have been caught. And uh, the, the issue with detecting a, a bad behavior is because you don't have identity, you have to actually catch them red-handed, so you need a very, very fast response. Uh, it's the same with, uh, I suppose, the you know, terrorism, these sort of acts. There's not much point forensically examining it after the event. In fact, the forensic examination actually adds to the publicity, which is the exact outcome that the, the perpetrators want. Uh, you really have to stop it happening. So uh, that means you need a very quick response. Whereas certainly with CCTV, it's almost always forensic analysis several weeks later. So generally it's up to 10 days before they collect the CCTV evidence and they analyze it and take it to court and so on, it takes several years. So that's, that's certainly one good use and that solves the problem of finding the crime because you know the crime's committed through some of the means, then you just go to the right camera. Uh, the hard thing is, how do you do this proactively, which is the video analytics side, where you detect the behavior or the identity in real time and send an alert when, say, a person of interest arrives, etc. And I think these, you know, that's you know, it's basically CCTV, and, and I think biometrics and CCTV would be a very good theme for this conference as well. And uh, this has already been discussed as a, a really major impediment. I think, you know, the border control, that sort of solve. I mean, it's out there, it's commercial, we're not going to do anything there. But yeah, CCTV surveillance, that's, I think that's a very uh, strong area and uh, much more valuable. And then my, my view is when you, know, when you walk into your house, you know, your wife recognizes you, your cat recognizes you, your dog recognizes you and waves its tail, but the computer just sits there until I log in. And the fridge does, the car doesn't know who I am. Why don't all these devices recognize me as well? And, and can we move from this big brother security thing to making life easier for people? Um, just you jump in your car and automatically adjust the mirrors, you know, um, and you don't have to do a thing, you just jump in. It's like when you, you know, walk into the office and you, know, you say to the office, oh, we'll get a cup of coffee. I mean, they know who you are, they know what your needs are, etc. Just make life easier. And um, this would be a nice focus of biometrics as well. You know, the security one, that's great, but how often do we get a Boston bombing? Fortunately, not very often. And, you know, they're all excited and all the agencies run around in circles and then they go back to what they were doing like, a few months ago. So, but, but the convenience thing, uh, being able to even just ha have a household system where every time somebody comes into your house, I'm out with three daughters. You know, oh, I'm interested when my daughters come home. You know, three o'clock in the morning, you know. Their behavior when they come home could be interesting too. Sometimes they're not walking very well. Uh, but I could also be interested in, in perhaps, um, you know, a, a, a male who comes into the house that I don't think you want in my house coming in as well. And I'd like to be able to detect the identity of someone there. So, you now can we sort of aim towards uh, the, uh, uh, democratization or the ubiquity of, of biometrics into people's lives. And this means robust uh, solutions that are fast, easy to deploy on mobile devices, etc. Yeah. Let me just add one thing. Yeah. Uh, so I agree with Brian that uh, uh, we need to look beyond uh, what is currently being used. Is are we using these technologies as a lock and key mechanism, or we want to actually use it as um, a facilitator? 
if we if we view these technologies as a security like the uh, biometrics of behavior, these are facilitators for our day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities, then we can actually leverage much more than if we just treat them as uh, lock and key mechanisms. So I think um, uh, while security is there, means we need to have a secure mechanism, and then uh, and both can help uh, individually or in combination. Uh, I think we need to broaden the scope a little bit more and say that uh, why not actually help in our day-to-day uh, -day activities. Yeah, I think I think that's really um, that's that's also the argument I, I would make. Is uh, and I actually as <laughs> I wrote a report I could, with with several other biometrics, European biometrics experts in 2000, and actually we said said in there, you know, that the the use of it would be convenience, convenience, convenience. You know, doing exactly these, these things. You know, making lives easier for citizens and consumers. And then unfortunately, 9/11 happened and. You know, we said it wasn't actually going to be exact enough to really work for security purposes, and we should focus on convenience. But then, with 9/11, the whole shift happened, and I think maybe it is absolutely time that we that we basically put it to you know go back to the convenience aspect and integrate it with with other technologies uh, as it is on the phone. And I think there are huge opportunities. You know, in, in, in terms of I think India is, is one example in terms of using it as an enabler. Exactly. To, to get to population as you could get to before to, to get services. But also also of course as, as you said in the home, you know, I mean I basically would probably uh, like to like my fridge to refuse to you know to just lock and not give me things. <laughs> you know, because you know basically because like with behavior, you know, we're often fighting ourselves. You know, bad habits are hard to change and we could use the technology as a friend and I think you're seeing that emerge, you know, with the the Fitbits and so on, you know, there's like your your the biometric buddy who helps. So what we can do as you walk towards the fridge there can be scales, you know, there's <laughs> and then immediately say, well you're half a pound heavier today so we're not getting any candy. So yes. Yeah. 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 And, and I'm very clear, really, I mean, they also see that. I mean, previously, say, with the cars, you know, with the cars in France, I mean, previously, if you had a, 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 a drinking, you know, a drinking, I mean, influence conviction, you know, basically, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't get your driving license back. You know, they, they changed their laws very drastically, but now it is, well, you can have it back, provided you have a car that will let you drive. Right? I'm thinking a couple of conferences we can start, since I tell you once to start more conferences. One is I took a conference on beast, behavior analysis of secure transactions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking now. Yeah. B E A, B is from behavior, B analysis A and S is security. <laughs> I took the conference on beast. You know, a lot of national geographic people may come. Yeah. Uh, other one we should probably have identity security for comfortable life. You know, for good life, good living. That should be conference, you know, security and identity for good life. So, like LG life is good, so we should do something like that. But anyway, it's really a shame that we are ending on such friendly <laughs> <laughs> The whole idea of doing this panel was to have some fun. But any, any other questions from the audience? They've been very quiet. Well, we are uh, actually uh, 10 o'clock, and I think uh, we should probably stop here. And I want to thank all that panelists for their wonderful comments and their good behavior. <laughs> 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 Disappointment about uh, so many of you.